helped tremendously. Test one, two, three? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's true. Switching on microphones helps amazingly. Uh, so, uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, to do the first part on the whiteboard. And since I actually have a stack of slides for streaming algorithms, I will go through those with slides and the projector. So the motivation is twofold. First of all, this way I, it's kind of silly not to use the slides if I have them. Secondly, I need feedback from you guys to tell me whether you prefer slides, whether you prefer whiteboard. Okay. So basically, after this and next lecture, possibly at the end of next week, I will need feedback from you to tell me which style you prefer. So I can do slides, not a big deal. Um, I figured that, well, this class might be best suited with whiteboard, whiteboards, but um, yeah, so this is in a way a little bit of an experiment uh, to see which one works best. It's not completely controlled because I can teach the same content twice. Um, but yeah, basically I need your help and feedback. Good. Um, chalks. Right. Maybe there's something hiding here. Yeah. Lots of chalk ends. More chalk ends. Good. OK, so I'm going to start with a brief recap, namely the Gauss Markov inequality, right? So that one basically just said the following thing. And because today we're going to start first with tail bounds, more tail bounds, and then even more tail bounds. And then afterwards, we'll go and use them. But it's probably a good idea to have them all in one place. And I mean, people have gotten 10 year four doing nothing else but that. And I can only really barely scratch the surface here. So remember what we had is that the probability of x greater than some constant times mu was less equal than 1 of that constant for mu being the expected value of x. So this is really probability over x. And furthermore, c obviously being greater than 1. Otherwise, this bound becomes rather useless. So actually, I would only have to really write c greater than 0, but nobody within his right mind would want to use a bound on a probability greater than 1. Mind you, there was an interesting workshop at NIPS, maybe about five years ago, on uniform conversions bounds less than 1 which tells you something about the state of the art in uniform convergence bounds in machine learning. OK. Um, so there's a useful corollary out of this. The probability over x of the min of i being in the set from 1 to k of xi being greater than c times mu, this is less equal than c to the minus k. Whenever, if the xi are iid from p. Okay. Does everybody know what iid stands for? Independent, identically distributed. So this is about as benign and vanilla as you can have it in machine learning, in statistics. It's a, an assumption that is typically violated in practice, but it's a useful assumption nonetheless. Can somebody give me an example of a case where this is clearly violated? Online, Online learning. Time series, yes. Time series is perfect. You have that dependence. Or, for instance, 
you know, your, the quality of your PhD thesis. It's clearly, well, you know, let's say, suppose somebody was able to, you know, assign a quality score to each of the theses. And then, well, you know, let's, let's assume so, so something like that existed and you, got, you guys are all going to write it and you're all very smart. So why is it not independent? Well, first of all, you all ended up at CMU. So that's a pretty good indicator. Now we can condition on that. Now, my hope is that you taking this class will help you write a better thesis. So I hope that the fact that you took my class will let you write a better thesis. So again, not independent. Now, as you go and condition on more and more things, you can sometimes make them independent. Sometimes conditioning can make things dependent. If you're curious about those things, you should stay on for Eric Singh's class after this. Okay, anyway. Um, now, so this is something that we're going to use extensively later on. And the nice thing is that you can see, you know, I take k variables, and if c, let's say c equals one half, then just by, you know, probing it k times, I can boost the probability of this failing. I, I can basically make that probability of failure go to, go to zero. So, what you can, for instance, do is you have some bound and you take the minimum over a bunch of random variables, each of which is an upper bound. Then I know that this is still an upper bound and I know that it's now going to be a much better upper bound than what I had before. We're actually going to use this later on, possibly next week when we do the complement sketch. Um, another useful thing is uh, to look at uh, quantiles. And you will be actually having fun with quantiles in the assignment. So let's define f of x to be the integral from minus infinity up to x of dp of x tilde, let's say. So basically, this is just, you know, if this is my density, it's maybe like so, whatever, then the cumulative distribution function will keep on going up and up and up. So it has a larger slope here and then, uh, well, it will keep on going up and it plateaus at one. Right. That's the CDF. That's f of x. This is p of x. So in MATLAB or Octave, easy to implement stuff like this with something called CUMSUM. So C-U-M. SUM, cumulative sum, <coughs> um, or just indexing things. So this is easy. Um, now, the question then is, you know, if we draw, you know, from some distribution of random variables, and I pick, let's say, I want to find, for instance, the largest one of them, or the smallest one of them. I mean, I could really go and evaluate the entire set, but I might also try and just find something that's with high probability, nearly as good as the best thing that I could do. Okay. So I, for instance, might want to do something as follows. I define fk of x to be the probability that min over i, i in 1 to k, that this thing here is less equal than x, right? Now, this is given by the probability that the first guy is less equal than x, the second one is less equal than x, and so on up to k. So this is nothing else but the product over i probability that xi less equal than x equals 1 to k. And here's the probability, of course, over the x size. Here's it's over the entire set, x1 to xk. And we know what that quantity is, right? What's that? It's the, exactly, it's f of x. So it's the cumulative distribution function. So therefore, this is nothing else but f to the k x. This is an extremely useful thing. If you take minima or maxima of, our, of random variables, the cumulative distribution function of that 
is very easy to access. This is also useful because if you have the cumulative distribution function, you also know the density of that, right? Because what we therefore know is that, well, you know, the density, you just apply the chain rule, right? So it's k times f to the k minus 1 of x and then dp of x. So those things are very easy to compute. And usually min or max look like quantities that would be really hard to deal with, but this is easy. So let me show you a corollary out of this. And it's, you know, really primitive, but really useful. And for lack of a better name, I call it the 5995 trick. And it goes as follows. Sorry, it's a min or max? Um, the min. This is the minimum. And you can easily see that as follows. Let's say I have a uniform distribution, right? In the interval between 0 and 1. Exactly. That's true. So therefore, sorry, sorry, the max. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. But for the minimum, you just take 1 minus f of x to the k. You do it the other way around. Yes. So here's what happens. Let's take the CDF of the uniform distribution between 0 and 1. It goes from 0 to 1 by the identity, and then, of course, you continue straight. Okay. So if I raise it to the power of k, this will go to something that behaves like so. Boom. It increases immediately. Right? So what this tells you is that now, because this is the quantile, right, that I have to wait for a very long time but very large values here are going to be even in the low quantile there. Okay. And that's basically what I'm exploiting in the 5995 trick. So more to the point, I'm going to go and pick k equals 59. So then I get, well, x to the 59 as my cumulative distribution function. And I'm now going to ask, what is the probability that things will fail with at most 5% probability? And what quantile am I then guaranteed to get? So then, well, all I have to do is just, I have to work out, well, x bar 0 0.95. This is where I want to get. This is the inverse of 0 0.95, which for the identity is just 0 0.95, so for the uniform distribution. And well, then what I can do is I can simply, you know, look at what, what is the probability that this will not fail too badly. So I take 0 0.95 raised to the power of k. This needs to be less equal than 0 0.05. So basically, this is my probability of something going wrong. And it turns out if you pick k equals 59, actually 58 and a half will do, uh, but you can't take half samples, then this inequality will be satisfied. And this is very easy to remember. So if you want to get a really large element from a set, let's say your set has a million observations. And you don't really want to actually carry out the full brute force search. You can just take a fairly small subset and then take the maximum of that. Okay. Can somebody tell me a case where this can go wrong? Sorry, I, somebody said something, but I couldn't quite hear it. If I have something that you know, has possibly very long tail. So if the largest element is possibly way larger than the pretty large elements. So basically, if the 0.95 quantile and 0.99 quantiles, for instance, are really far apart from each other, then this could be a problem. 
So stuff like this happens, for instance, if you operate a nuclear reactor and typically nothing goes wrong, but there's a very small probability something very horribly can go wrong. Then just looking at 59 average days and saying, well, it's worked fine, so therefore it has to work, is a very dangerous reasoning. On the other hand, if you're, for instance, shopping for an item on the internet, let's say you want to buy a new, pa new pair of headphones, and you sample maybe 10 websites, and you look at the price and you find the best among those 10, then you can be pretty sure that, yeah, this is probably a decent price that you found and you shouldn't be wasting more time on that. Also because there, you know, the value is quite well bounded from below. Of course, it doesn't always quite work out, but this is a very easy trick of accelerating your algorithm whenever you have a max statement. Example, submodular optimization. So in submodular optimization, there are a couple of tricks how you can be lazy and lazily evaluate things. But whenever you can assume that even the average element isn't so much, you know, worse than you know, the very best element that you could have picked, then an algorithm that greedily adds one element at a time and you just pick from a random subset is probably going to do quite well. Okay. So this is a very, very simple trick, but yeah. It improves your algorithms a lot. Okay. Um, so the next thing to do, and this is just using Gauss inequality, we now derive the Chebyshev inequality. So before I do so, it's probably worthwhile to briefly squint at those two lines, right? And there was a big difference between this, right? So here we had basically a probability that went like one over, you know, whatever constant I'm interested in, one over this bound. And here we had something that actually, you know, decayed exponentially in the number of samples or tests or trials or whatever I used. So this has, well, not very, not very surprisingly, it's more like an exponential tail bound. And there's a rather fundamental difference between the Gauss-Markov and the Chebyshev bound on one side and the exponential tail bounds on the other side. Uh, deriving those would be a little bit beyond what we do in this class. Um, so they might be doing this in the 701 to, uh, 702 class, actually. And we actually derived the basic ch uh, Chernoff bound in 701. So if you want, just look at the video of that. Um, but before we do so, uh, before we get into that, let's qu quickly have a look at the Chebyshev inequality. So that, I guess most of you know it, you can easily derive by just defining some random variable z to be x minus mu squared. So we know, and mu is of course the expectation of z. So we know that the expected value of z is sigma squared, right? That's just the variance. Now, therefore, we can look at the probability that x minus mu is greater than gamma times sigma, which equals the probability that, because I can square all those terms, right? So is equals the probability that said, that said is greater then gamma squared, sigma squared. Okay. And so then by just applying Gauss Markov, so we have this quantity here, we know what mu is. So we therefore know that this is less equal than one over gamma. So what we just got is therefore that, you know, if I fix this, typical deviations will be, you know, in the order of, you know, standard deviation. But we have slightly different scaling behavior here. So sometimes we'll use this in order to, because basically the good thing about this inequality is 
it did not require us to have any upper bound on x in any way. All we needed is just that the first and second moment are well defined. Once you have that, you're done. So that's quite a difference to what some of the other bounds require. So for instance, Chernoff usually requires that you have bounded random variables. This one here doesn't. And so sometimes when you ch can just get you know, some form of a bound that's on, on, the, on the first few moments, you can still get a good tail bound. And I'll show you as we go along how you can design something that, for all practical purposes, behaves similar to a Chernoff bound, but doesn't require boundedness. OK, good. So this is the Chebyshev inequality. I guess that's all kind of well behaved. So an obvious corollary, let's say I have some random variables, xi, and they are drawn you know, from p of x. And I have some variance, sigma squared. So we all know that the variances add up. And we also know that you, know, you can just exploit you know, linear scaling. So now let me define x bar to be 1 over n sum over i equals 1 to n xi. Okay, just the average. Now we know that the expected value e of x bar is mu. Is, you know, that doesn't change by linearity. Furthermore, I know that the variance of x bar does change. It goes like 1 over n sigma squared. That happens because I sum over n independent terms, so the variances add up. But each of them has a contribution sigma squared of n squared, so that's what you get. Now this is, yeah, Charles Clay, right? Now let's actually use that for something a little bit less trivial. On top of that, we need that as an intermediate result later on anyway. So let's plug it in here. So what we get is that now sigma squared turns into sigma squared over n if we want to know how much an average will deviate from the mean. And so, what we get is that basically we can, without much ado, rather than you know, having a deviation of plus minus sigma, we'll get a deviation of plus minus sigma over square root n as the key term. Right. So is everybody OK with that derivation, or should I go through details? Who wants, who wants details? Nobody? Who's OK with it? Good. Thanks. Um, so this is fairly straightforward. Um, so now, uh, the next thing is, well, you know, OK, so first of all, what's the good thing about this? Well, the good thing is that the uncertainty scales with you know, one, one over square root sample size. That's about as good as you can expect it. So if you have Gaussian random variables, you average them. This is how your variance goes down. There's nothing you can do. So that gives you a lower bound on the order. So that's the best, order, best rate you can get. The problem is that it's not a very good bound in terms of the probability itself, right? This probability goes like you know, 1 over epsilon. So if you want to have a really fine guarantee here, then you know, those probabilities go bad very quickly. So if you want to get something that holds for very small failure probabilities, your bounds get really bad. And so the idea is maybe we can use something like what you can have in a chain of bound to you know, combine it with this. And this is going to give us a fairly useful technique. And I, for lack of a better name, I'm calling it the median average trick. So one of the places, for instance, where it's worked through in great detail is by, in a paper by Alon, Matthias, and Shegedi.
and I think it's from 1992 or something around that time. But it's actually a very, it, it's kind of a standard trick by now in theoretical computer science. So the idea is as follows. You, when you have a lot of random variables, okay, so let's just say each of those bins, each of those entries in this matrix is a random variable drawn from the same distribution. In order to get the best estimate, what you could do is you could just take the average over all of them. So these are entries, you know, x, i, j. So what you could do is you could take the average over all the x, i, j, and then, you know, this is your estimate. This is actually going to be the estimate with the smallest amount of variance. However, this is not, not necessarily the most robust estimate. So instead, what you do is you define x bar i, let's say we have n here and d there, to be 1 over n sum over j equals 1 to the n x i j. And then you define x hat to be the median of all these x i's. Rather than the average, we pick the median here. The median makes it robust. And what we're going to derive in detail is that this construction here will give us basically the more like exponential tail bound type of properties that we know from Chernoff and others. And then at the same time, it won't require the xij's to be bounded random variables. They can be unbounded, but basically you then just focus on the case when they are when they are bounded and everything's good. Yep. Why don't you just take the median of all the entries? Why do you need the Okay. I could do that. Now, if I was to take the median, then I would need to have a reasonably good idea of what my distribution does near the median. First of all, the median may not even be close to the mean. Right? And if I'm after the mean, then taking the median of all will give me something else. So I'll have bias. Secondly, um, so if this is my distribution, here's, let's say, mean and median coincide, I need to know, you know, what goes on around this. I mean, it's nice if it's symmetric, but it need not be. So I could have, for instance, something where a lot of horrible things happen here, then it's basically flat and then, you know, maybe tapers off like so. Um, so, and also, you know, having good information about the variance here is not so trivial. So that's why usually just taking the median, while this is the most robust estimate, it's not necessarily the quantity that you want. Um, does everybody know about robust estimators? Uh, who's, who's heard of them before? Okay, it's about half the audience. Um, so a robust estimator is something that has, that does not degrade in a pathological manner when some of the random variables are drawn for, from, for instance, a wrong distribution. Um, so the oldest example of that is the foot rule. So basically in the Middle Ages, people wanted to know, you know how long, you know, they wanted to have a transportable measurement unit. And one of them was the foot. Now, unfortunately, they didn't have the system of you know, handing out reference feet and then you know, passing them on from village to village. So the rule went as follows. Have, I think it was 12, pick the first 12 uh, men who walk out of church on a Sunday after mass. Send home the two with the shortest feet. Send home the two with the longest feet. Have the remainder of them line up, divide it by eight, and you have you know, a good estimate for the foot. So this was the first example of a trimmed mean estimator. And you know, at the time, I mean, people sometimes had very disfigured feet. So you really wanted to send the cripples home, and possibly you know, the ones where the toe was hanging off by a thread. Right? So, this is an example where the breakdown point of the estimator would have been two. 
if you have more than two people with disfigured feet in that group, um, this would have affected the estimator. And so there is an interesting trade-off between robustness of an estimate and the efficiency, namely how well it can actually take advantage of all the data. And if you're interested in this, there's a very nice book by Huber. And it's called Robust Statistics. Effectively, we're doing something very similar here. Right? Yep? You seem to be doing almost the opposite here. Instead of taking the median first and then taking the mean, you're taking the mean first followed by the median. That's true. Is there a, can you switch those around and get the same um, I So the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm interested in the mean. If I was to take the median first and the mean second, then I would get a reasonably decent estimate of the median. And that might actually be quite a fun problem to study, you know, a good, to get a good concentration of measure inequality for that procedure that you describe. I don't know of a paper off the top of my head that does this, but this sounds like a very fun algorithm in its own right. But since I'm after the mean, I need to at least start with getting the mean. But that's, yeah, very good comment. Well, it's completely arbitrary. You just, but all you need is you just need a number of samples that can be factored in <coughs> integers. Otherwise, it's kind of awkward. So if we know like multiple partitions, for example, average variables, that'd be better? No, no, but the thing is, I can, pl I can trade off D and N, right? And I, so I could, for instance, take fewer rows and you know, have more elements per, per row. Or I could have, you know, a small number of terms per row, but then lots of rows. And I'll show you in a moment how those two things actually interact with each other. So basically, elements, basically number of columns, will control for the variance. So you can drive your variance down by controlling this. Because that's really how we do deal with the average. Number of rows is how confident you want to be about the estimate. So these are the two knobs that you can turn. And so as you get more data, you can, of course, increase both. And it really depends on you know, your desire for risk. OK. So let's see. Um, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not using that to estimate the variance. Uh, that said, there are also robust estimators for variance, and they would do related things because now you have another random variable, which is, you know, x i squared, and so you'd basically need to obtain a robust estimate for x i squared. You'd need to obtain a robust estimate for x. And then you combine them, and you have to do a little bit of extra work to make sure that because you approximate on both ends, you're not losing out too much. OK. Good. So now here's what we do. So if I average within a row, I get that the probability that you know x hat i minus mu is greater than, you know, gamma times sigma is less equal than 1 over gamma squared, squared n. OK. Um, um, let me just make sure we got this right. No, we didn't. So we get that the expected value. Yeah, I think I did things a little bit too quickly. Let's just derive it. So we know that the variance here is sigma squared over n. We have the 
let us define <coughs> gamma squared sigma squared to be so beta times that equals gamma squared sigma squared. So in other words, beta is gamma squared is in gamma squared. And so then we get, um, yeah, basically 1 over gamma squared in. Yep. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so therefore, I now, as in the next step, need to bound the probability that this deviates by more than, you know, gamma times sigma. So, now the probability that the median of I of, you know, basically Xi hat minus mu this thing here is greater than gamma times sigma. Well, now let's think about what can happen. So here's the true mean, and here are all the values that I can get for the median, as for you know for those small subsamples. Now for the median to deviate by more than that quantity here, I need to require that more than half of the events lie outside this range. Otherwise, nothing can go wrong. Right? So I need to be particularly unlucky that e either everything is down here or up here, but otherwise, nothing can go wrong. Now, each of those random variables in their own right have a probability of 1 over gamma squared n to go wrong. Okay. So, I also know what the, I therefore know what the expected number of things that go wrong in this interval is. It's basically d, time, time, d over gamma squared n. That's the expected number of things that can go wrong. So I now have a binary random variable, 0 if things are good, 1 if they go wrong. I want to make sure that this random variable does not exceed d over 2. And I know I have an upper bound on the expected value, which is d over gamma squared n. Okay. So. Xi. So let's... Let's call it psi i. And we know that the expected value of psi i is less equal than 1 over gamma squared n. And what I want to bound is the probability that sum of a psi i equals 1 to d is less equal then d over 2. And this is a standard case for a Chernoff bound. So small insert, Chernoff bound basically does the following thing. It says that the probability that sum over i xi minus sum over i expected value of xi, right? that this is greater than epsilon has the probability over all the x's. Here, of course, has to be less equal than e to the minus 2 epsilon squared over c squared, where c squared is sum over i a i minus b i squared, where x i is in the range between 
A and A I and B I. Okay. So let me decode this. This basically tells me that with very high probability, which is now exponential in this epsilon, the empirical average and the expectation are close, provided that my gap is of a similar scale as what a very crude upper bound on the variance would be. Because obviously the variance of the random variable xi cannot be larger than a minus b squared. That's impossible. It's, you know, one uh, quarter a minus b in the worst of all cases, and that's about it. I cannot do worse than that. So if things are recalibrated by the natural variance of the random variables, then I can get a tight bound. Now for binary random variables, a equals zero, b equals one. So this basically now becomes then, you know, d. And we know what the mean. We also can work out what epsilon is. So this is channel. So we know that c squared equals d. We furthermore know that mu equals d over gamma squared in. From that, we can work out what the, what epsilon is. Epsilon is simply d times, you know, one half minus one over gamma squared in. So for convenience, I'm now going to pick this to be one quarter. There isn't really much more benefit than squeezing it in one way or the other. In which case, that basically means that 1 over gamma squared n has to be 1 quarter. In other words, gamma is going to be uh, so it's basically 2 over square root n. Okay. So there we have the relative scale. So this is exactly the same same type of rate as what we have before. Basically averaging gives us one over square root n rates. Notice there's no dependence on d because we didn't use it. We just use this to you know domesticate the variance. So basically epsilon is d over four. So then from that, it follows that this probability is less equal than um, e to the minus 2 times d squared over 16th divided by d. If that's c squared, so this goes away. And so we have, this is e to the minus 1 over 8 times d. You can get better constants by being a little bit more careful, but it doesn't really change things very much. So what you now have is a guarantee where you can adjust your level of confidence by playing with d. Basically, adding rows increases the confidence. <coughs> adding columns increases the accuracy. So unlike typical Bernstein bounds, unlike typical Chebyshev bounds, you now have with this median and averaging mechanism two knobs that you can control independently of each other. This is something that most machine learning papers don't do. And I'm not quite entirely sure why they don't do it, but it's a very straightforward and easy thing how to, you know, tune both parameters without necessarily having to do a lot of gymnastics otherwise. 
We're going to use that very trick later on when we look at the AMS sketch because they actually use this for a random variable that will give us F2, which is the second moment of a, of a stream. Um, any questions so far? Yep? So given a fixed number of data, I'm trying to look at the optimal way to split it into okay. different groups. Uh, that doesn't seem to indicate any dependence on the number of columns. Mm, no. The optimal way, there's no one optimal way, right? Because basically what you get is that there's going to be a trade-off between probability delta that something fails and epsilon, right? So, you know, delta is, okay, let's say d times n equals m, right? So we can stratify by d. So delta is e to the minus 1 eighth d. And then n, which is gamma, well, that's basically, you know, that, that's essentially the rescaled version of the uncertainty, is going to be, because n is now m over d, so therefore gamma is, 2 over square root m over d. So basically we have square root d over m times 2. Now you can trace that curve. And depending on how you pick d, you'll get something that has a very low probability but very high, but high error or something that has, you know, a very large failure probability, but fairly high confidence, but, you know, a tight range. And that's effectively what you would expect, right? I can, you know, let's say I can give you, let's say your job is to find out, you know, whether a drug works. And maybe you see a slight effect, and then can you, you can say, well, with a given level of failure probability, you're willing to accept that this drug is effective or not. So that's exactly what you can trace here. Yep? So where do you get gamma from? Gamma That's what I got by setting this to be one quarter. So you could see that you could potentially squeeze out a little bit more juice here by being a little bit more clever than setting it to a quarter. But if I let gamma go to zero, so if I let gamma go to infinity, the best thing I'll get is one half. So I'm not going to do much better than you know a factor two better relative to what we have here. So there's, you know, you might as well give up at a quarter, right? Uh, but what I'm saying is by being a little bit more clever about this and by exploiting some other properties a little bit more cleverly about it about the chain of bounds, because it's not the only chain of bound you can find, you can do slightly better. Uh, that said, the variant of the chain of bound that's referenced in the Alion, Matthias, and Segedi paper, I was unable to find even by tracing it back to the book that they cited in other books. Um, so you'll see it on the slide deck. But basically, I managed to derive that bound within a factor of two of what they got. And that's about it. So don't always believe people when they give you specific constants. Don't trust me either. OK, good. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to do in terms of concentration of measure inequalities is to give you two bounds by MacDiarmid. And these are amazingly useful bounds. And they essentially extend the Chernoff bound, and then later on, something called a Bernstein inequality. So you should probably look those up on Wikipedia because, and I'm just giving you in each case the really simplest versions. So Chernoff we already have. And the other one is Bernstein. Yeah, probably here it's pronounced Bernstein, but yeah. Yeah, Amber, that's what it means actually. Um, yeah. So. Remember, the, the turn of bound was one 
expressed for sums of independent random variables. Now, the key property that effectively you exploit for sums of independent random variables is that if I change one random variable a little bit, the average is, for instance, not going to change too much, right? So, the, so basically, each individual term can only contribute to a bounded extent. That's like the idea of democracy, right? Now, what you can do then is you can say, well, let me take an arbitrary function f of x1 through xn. And now for this arbitrary function, which depends on those independent random variables, I'm going to show that the specific value that I get from empirically drawing from this is not going to be too far from the expectation. So I'm interested in comparing this to the expectation over all the x's of f of x1 through xn. And averages are just one such case. But for instance, f could be invoke an algorithm such as a support vector machine, look at the outcome, and then look at the prediction errors. And this actually led to a very nice series of papers, the first one by Buske and Elisev, on algorithmic stability. Yes, the name's unusual. Around 2001. Could be also 2000. Or 2002? Okay, thanks. Yes, Googling it is much faster. Um, and then Shai Scheller Schwartz did some useful work more recently on basically algorithmic stability. Pardon? They have yes, yes. Um, so they were the first ones that I know of. They have a very specific proof for least mean squares error. A more general proof that is related to theirs, and we were versed by a factor of two, is in our book, and that's the only reference to that. We didn't bother writing a paper about it. This is a lot more general, so he actually spends considerable amount of time on looking at stability there. Um, this is to some extent related to strong convexity. So I guess Suvrit has probably touched upon that already to some extent. So the idea is basically that if I change, so again there, if I change my data a little bit, the, est the outcome of the optimization problem will not change too much. And that's exactly the property that you use to use in those bounds. Okay, good. With that long lead up, what I'm interested in is the probability of this minus that being greater than, let's say, epsilon. Okay. And the first, and this is the slightly simpler bound from 1995, and this was a big deal, is I define CI to be the max of f of x1 through x, well, basically bar i, and then again xi plus 1 up to xn. And this is the max over x bar i minus f of x1 through xn. So this is basically how much can a single coordinate here or a single observation change the outcome? If that change is substantial, then the CI is going to be large. And so this is exactly the same thing as what we had up here, right? We ha these were basically our CIs. They measured you know, how much changing a single variable can change the overall outcome. Okay. Um, depending on what you need, Yes, you may or may not have it. So in this case, I think there is an absolute value, but there are also variants without. So the paper has, I think, three different variants of that theorem, and some of them do, some of them don't. 
So what you then do is you define C is sum over I CI squared, that's C squared, and very surprisingly, you get the same statement as up here. You get that this is less equal than E to the minus epsilon squared over C squared times 2. So this is, as a matter of fact, the turn of bound comes out as a corollary of this, which is very amazing. Um, then 10 years later, actually 11 years later, in 2006, there's a paper by McDiarmid and Reed. And what they did is they extended this to what's called self-bounding functions. And the intuition is actually very easy. Namely, if I have some, a quantity like the variance, when the variance is large, then you know, changing a single variable will change the overall value of the variance a lot. If the variance is small, then changing a single value will not change things very much. So in other words, when everything is nice and all the numbers are small, then often also the variance is small. And this way you can get considerably tighter bounds. You'll be having fun with that actually in the assignment. Yeah, so this is independent of what data type the x's are. That's one of the nice things. These are just independent random variables. Um, the only thing is that f has to be a real valued function. So basically, as long as f ingests it, I can feed web pages into this. As a matter of fact, this is one of the analysis you can do. There's a couple of other very nice inequalities, like there is this uh, theorem by Ledoux and Talagrand where you look at Markov chains and you know, change some things, and then you look at the eigenvalues of a graph and give analysis for that. And this is stuff that you can use for leave one out estimates and other more fancy constructions. But these are sort of the workhorses of what you, basically, you try these first. If they don't work, then you do something fancier. Because these are so much easier to apply. So let me give you the example. So. Basically, what you do there is you, so self-bounding functions have the following form. You basically sum over i g of x. Oh, okay, well, let me call them f of x minus g i of x, and I'll explain in a moment what they are. If the sum here is less equal than a times f of x plus b, so basically these gi's are functions of the form, um, for instance, here min over you know this particular x bar i again of f of x without x i, but then x bar i inserted on it in its stead. Right? So this is basically how bad could things go if I replaced one observation by something else. But I'm now adding all those contributions. And then I want to make sure that this is well bounded. So for instance, the maximum of a bunch of random variables cannot get too bad in some cases. Right? So what you do is, if this holds, then the following probability holds. The probability of a large deviation is less equal than e to the minus epsilon squared over 2 a mu plus b plus a times epsilon. 
that's for an upper bound, basically if this is a less equal, and for a lower bound, you get the same quantity e to the minus epsilon squared over 2 a mu plus b plus a epsilon over 3. You can just look that up in the McDiarmid paper, and I think uh, this was also attached to the assignment anyway. So in case, look for McDiarmid in the lead. OK, so let's decode a little bit what's going on here. Because this, is, this doesn't look like much, but it's a very powerful result. So if a equals 0, right? And so we only have b then this turns exactly into our chain of bound within a factor of 4, right? So we have epsilon squared over b. And before that, well, we had, you know, similar quantity here. So that's kind of what you would expect. Now, if b equals 0 and there's only a, then you get basically two competing effects in the denominator. Let's say epsilon is much larger than the mean, right? Yep. Is there supposed to be a squared somewhere? Because I think there should be a squared here, yes. That. Yes, there should be a squared, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that also makes sense in terms of the units. So basically, yeah. you know, attach pounds or meters or whatever to it, and it needs to divide out. Right. That's a usual physicist trick for checking sanity of formulas. The units need to cancel out. Um, so basically, that's like a scaling analysis. In other words, if you, can t if you have a theorem, and you can make it a lot better by just rescaling things by arbitrary units, you don't have a theorem. OK, so yes, absolutely b squared. So now let's look at these other terms. Um, let's say b equals 0, and I only have a then I basically get two regimes. One case in which epsilon is so small that that second term vanishes relative to the mean. So in other words, if I'm very close to the mean already, then it's really a standard epsilon squared over, you know, basically something like the mean squared. So it doesn't really change much from a chain of bound. On the other hand, whenever epsilon is way larger than the mean, and essentially the mean doesn't matter, and I get the behavior that goes like more like e to the minus epsilon. And that's a much faster decay. So for large epsilons, I get a very fast decay, and only once I really zoom in close to the expected value will I, will I slow down. And that makes a lot of sense. So for instance, if you want to estimate the voltage, right? So, and here it's like 110 volts or something like that. So, you only need very few estimates to kind of get into the right ballpark of, okay, it's going to be about 110 volts. Once you want to figure out exactly what it is, it turns very much into an averaging procedure. By the way, the same thing you also get in online learning quite often, where you have fast initial conversions with stochastic gradient descent, and at some point it turns into an averaging procedure, and the entire convergence slows down. That's exactly the same effect that's happening here. There are also, in learning theory, those large margin bounds. So there's a guy called Zubakov. And essentially, if you are building a classifier, right? If you have a large margin property, in other words, there's nothing inside this margin here, then, well, you get very good rates. Because as soon, you know, as soon as you're sort of kind of even just close to the decision boundary, everything is good. On the other hand, if there's a lot of data exactly near the ma margin, then it will take you a lot of data until you've applied enough of an averaging procedure to weed out exactly where that boundary should be. And you can quantify the, this. 
This is what Alex Zubikov has really made a career out of. He's also done a lot of other great things, but that's one of the really key ideas that he's worked on a lot. And then you get necessary and sufficient conditions for learnability in this context. Okay. So, the, so just to recap, what this bound does, and the Bernstein inequality would do the same thing, but this is a much nicer device, so that's why I'm only showing you the nicer device, is you have this nice switching between regimes. Far away from the mean, you get a fast rate. Close to the mean, you slow down to a variance reduction by averaging. OK. Any more questions about that so far? OK, then we're going to switch gears, as in we're going to switch to using the projector. And so the. Pardon? You said closer to the mean, the variance is reduced. Um, well, now closer to the mean, you basically need to switch to a procedure that's effectively a variance reducer. Right? So basically, close to the mean, the only thing you can do to get better is average. And there's not much else you can do. You just have to average and wait. And at some point, well, OK. So we have to adopt specific procedures. Well, Essentially, that's, for instance, what we're using with that median, right? Um, but then, you know, no, sorry, with a mean. And then far away, we just use the median to make sure we take advantage of the faster conversions and the tails. So in other words, this mean and median mixture trick that we just used before is very much also an example of using exactly those steps. OK, so now let's see whether it all works. OK, the projector needs to warm up. And I think I need to dim one of the panels down. Should sort of kind of do. Okay, good. In case you wonder, this is Cafe Tosca in San Francisco. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, these are a subset of slides that I taught two years ago in Berkeley, and I was still at Yahoo. Yeah, it has nothing to do with a lot of Yahoo showing up today. But I just didn't have the heart to rebrand them. <laughs> OK, data streams. So what we're going to do is basically look a little bit more at motivations, because I think on Monday, some people were a little bit perplexed as, why on earth do you even care about doing those things? And then we'll look at some examples. So it's going to keep us busy for the rest of today, and then also all of next week. So the first thing is, well, for data streams, you really can't replay the data. That's a big issue. And you have you know, a limited memory and computational footprint, and you have real-time requirements, as in you receive the data, and continuously I'm going to ask you about results. So for instance, yesterday there was actually a talk by some folks from Twitter who talked about Storm, which more or less kind of covered the computational infrastructure aspect of you know, some of this processing. I'm going to talk about the algorithms that drive it and will be moderately oblivious to how it's being done. So for a time series, I mean, you observe instances, X and T with a timestamp. This could be stock symbols, acceleration data, server logs, whatever. Um, then there's something called a cache register type of analysis where you basically observe weighted instances, but there's always positive revenue coming in, so you never take money out of the cash register. On the other hand, there's something called turnstile. This is more like, let's say, you take the subway and uh, people enter and leave, 
And at any time, you might be asked, well, how many people are currently in the subway? Okay. So here's an example of you know, what you want to do. So this was from two years ago. Well, page views on my site. And there was this peak, and it's very clear this was around NIPS, and so everybody wanted to see whether my papers were already up, and no, they weren't, and then, yeah, okay, after that, they went away. Um, yes. So a lot of people sign up for this analytics service, and I mean, the idea is, you know, you want to know exactly who's on your site right now, so you want to have it in real time. You want to be able to do that at scale, and you don't want to use a lot of computers at it. So what I'm describing may or may not or may be unrelated to algorithms being in use in Google. So this is no statement whatsoever about what Google does. Okay. Um, so these are, for instance, query streams. And you might want to ask something like, you know, how popular is machine learning versus data mining? And well, you can clearly see, well, it's picking up. And then it's quite interesting in where machine learning is more popular than data mining, and yes, CMU is in the top six. Um, my guess is uh, I hope it's going to be higher up by now. Um, but sometimes you then also want to um, you know, detect trends really early. So you want to find heavy hitters. So it's not just finding aggregate statistics, but also you want to detect as quickly as possible when something goes wrong. And yeah, OK, there's network traffic, financial time series. Here's a data stream you may not necessarily have thought of. It's news, it's a data stream. You might want to do reasonable analytics on that. So maybe same story from some several sources. Maybe the stories are related, and so on. So this is just a little bit of the type of data that you might encounter. Here's what you might want to do with it. So you might want to compute moments. And well, you get some stream of M items. You want to compute statistics of what we've seen. So if we have only a very small number of distinct items, then asking something like, you know, how many times did you see a particular item is trivial, right? You just create some lookup table. Each time you see a new item, you add it to that lookup table. You increment the counters, and that's it. And so if I have n distinct items, then you know, cardinality is order n. And computation for storage and lookup is order log n, because I need to address this. OK, so easy. Um, if I have a lot of data, then, well, that cardinality may not work. So for instance, if I have visitors to a website, then this number may very well be considerably beyond you know tens or hundreds of millions of users. So if you think about Facebook, it has over a billion users by now. If I want to you know, have a Facebook tracker for likes and follows and whatever on some site, I might actually have a fairly large number of distinct items that I can see. And on top of that, really testing exactly for previous occurrence is just pretty much impossible. So I need some data structure that's approximate and dynamic. Now, there's a lot of different and very nifty algorithms that you can use for that. Let's start with something very simple. It's a puzzle for you guys. Let's say I give you a sequence of instances between 1 and n. And I'm going to show you each of them exactly once. And one of them is missing. And your task is to identify it. How do you do that? So you sum them together, yes. And then you basically look at the end what the difference between the full sum and uh, what you got is. Exactly. So that's exactly what you get. And we need at least you know, log in significant bits. And that's all we need. Uh, why don't we need as many significant bits as the total sum over all the elements? I can take the mod, yes. Basically, overflow doesn't hurt me because uh, the least significant bits will be all that I need to answer this question. Okay. Now, let's say up to k elements are missing and you want to get them. How would you do that? 
Any ideas? Okay, so the idea is to use the same trick as before, and it's, it's a strict generalization. Basically, before that, we used only linear functions of the observations. But you could, you know, raise them to some power p, and again, you, do, you use mod to, you know, not have to deal with, you know, the overflow, or you just use finite bits and you overflow, and as in you wrap around again. And so for each element, you decrement, for instance, all those numbers as follows. And so in the end, you get a linear system of equations for, you know, basically k unknowns and k variables, and then you're done. So once you have noisy versions, this is not so trivial anymore, by the way. But basically, this is a very simple algorithm to identify up to k of the missing ones. So if I want to compare files, stuff like this can be used quite nicely. Um, there's some very nice work by a guy called George Varghese, um, who's done, so he's at UCSD, and who's done very nice work on this. I think he's now at Microsoft. So this was a warm-up. Um, let's now at least define what I mean by estimating moments. And then I think we're out of time for today anyway, and we'll recap on Monday. So moments are defined on data streams a little bit differently from how they are done usually. So usually a moment is something like the expected value of x to the p. Now, since I don't know how long my data stream is, you just throw away the normalization. So you basically just define fp to be the sum over all the counts for a particular item raised to the power of p. So the obvious catch is you need to know how many times you've seen this before you can compute it. Right. So therefore, if I only have a very small number of distinct items, I just look them up, look at the counter, sum it up, and I'm done. Um, now, f1 is the only quantity that's absolutely trivial to compute. It's just total sum of items that you've seen. You build a counter, problem solved. f0 is the number of distinct items that there are. So for instance, if you want to know how many species there are in an ecosystem, then it's really f0 that you're after, right? And you, know, you basically have maybe a bunch of volunteers who happily go and catch animals or take pictures of them or you know do something else to them and you want to find out how many distinct animals they are and so obviously they will be quite unlikely to really find all the distinct ones but what you can do is you can take essentially note of whenever you see a new one or for instance if you're running a website you want to know how many unique visitors there are Rather, and this is useful if, for instance, somebody you know, is operating a bot and is hitting your website maybe 10,000 times and you have only a total of 50 users, visitors, but you get a lot of traffic, then you know something's up. F2, that describes essentially something like the variance. So basically how skewed the counts are. This is something that's useful if in any algorithm you at some point have terms that are quadratic in the number of interacting terms. So remember when we talked about the, um, the minhash and you know, how you implement it, at some point you had to emit for all matching pair, for all, basically for all the collisions, you had to construct all the pairs. And this was quadratic in the number of you know, matches that you had for a particular key. So that's where getting your hands on F2 would be, for instance, really useful because then you can possibly avoid some of those things. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you with a small puzzle of why this algorithm is not completely crazy. This is the so-called Flagely-Martin counter. Basically, what I'm going to do is for each element that I see, I compute a hash. And the only thing that I'm going to store is the longest number of consecutive least significant ones that I've seen so far. 
In other words, if I see this object and I compute this hash, well, that's a zero. If I see this hash, and it's a two, maybe this is a four, and if I, yeah, by doing this, in the end, after viewing the entire data stream, I'll get some number, which is the largest number of consecutive ones. So my puzzle question for you is, why is this a good idea? OK, good. So with that, I'll leave it to you for today. You get the answer on Monday, or you can probably look it up by searching for Flagellet Martin and reading the paper, either of which is good. OK, good. Thanks for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.